Welcome to part one of our HIV testing and prevention webinar series, Epidemiology, Guidelines and Counseling, Expanding PrEP for Cis and Transgender Women. To receive continuing education credit for this activity, you must take the pre and post test. If you have not yet taken the pretest and you are viewing this webinar live, you will find the pretest link in your reminder email, and the post test link will be sent to you after the webinar. If you're viewing this webinar on demand, both the pre and post test links can be found below this video. In the webinar dashboard, you should see a chat box that you can use to enter questions throughout the webinar, which our faculty will answer at the end. In about four weeks, you will receive an email from ARHP's education department with a link to a follow up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you've incorporated what you learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre and post test, as well as this follow-up evaluation, helps ARHP ensure we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. At this time, I would like to introduce our faculty, Jill Crank and Dr. Kathleen Besink. Jill Crank has been providing comprehensive primary care focusing on LGBTQ health and HIV treatment and prevention in Baltimore for almost 10 years. She is board certified as a family nurse practitioner from the American Nurses Credentialing Center and certified as an HIV specialist from the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Kathleen Besink is a professor of pharmacy and the chair of experiential and continuing education credit at the Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy. Her clinical practice area is community pharmacy, and she specializes in women's health and public health issues. She's actively involved with several professional organizations, including the California Pharmacists Association, the Association of Reproductive Health Professionals, the Los Angeles Safe Opioid Prescribing Task Force, the California Society of Health Systems Pharmacists, and the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. We're thrilled to have them with us today, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jill. Alrighty, hi everybody. Um, first, just want to acknowledge that this educational activity is made possible through a grant from Gilead Sciences. And here is uh, the list of the planning committee who prepared the slides, gave comments, and what the disclosures are. So we're going to um, move on to our objectives. Having a little bit of a delay, moving forward. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So we're going to describe the epidemiology of HIV infection for cis and trans women in the U.S., talk about screening guidelines for different populations, um, identify um, counseling techniques that are non-judgmental and inclusive of gender and sexual uh, minorities, and explain current research, uh, knowledge gaps, and how to use PrEP in cis and transgender women. So when we discuss HIV today, um, we're going to be talking about PrEP for um, justice and transgender women. We know very much so that there's lots of research and talk out there about using PrEP in men, um, especially men who have sex with men, but we're focusing on a population that also needs to be um, talked about more and, and, and brought up in healthcare settings. And because terminology can be new for some people, we want to provide a brief review of how we're going to use terminology in this presentation. So first is PrEP. Uh, this is uh, referring to pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's where some, it's a program where people take one pill a day to protect themselves against a potential HIV exposure. It is different than PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, and that's where someone takes uh, medication for 28 days following a high-risk exposure. So when we say PrEP today, we're referring to the combination pill seen on the slide, um, which is um, sold as Truvada. And while the CDC does refer to alternative regimens that have been tested in some population, this co-formulated pill Truvada is the only PrEP medication which has been approved for all populations who meet the CDC criteria in the US. And we are also only going to be referring to the once daily dosing regimen as it is also the only approved regimen to take. We um, also are aware of previous and current studies for alternative options for PrEP, um, such as vaginal gels, rings, injectables, 
but those studies have not resulted in FDA approval or updated guidelines. So we're going to mention those for future options, but focus on the oral medication today. So getting into um, the discussion of sex and gender. So sex is uh, the term that refers to the sex assigned at birth, which is based on assessment of genitalia, chromosomes, gonads. And it can be interchangeably used with gender in everyday language, but they're actually quite different terms. Um, gender identity is a person's internal sense of, of their self and their um, identity as to how they fit into the world in terms of gender. And there are many different um, you know, terms to use. So there's four listed here. We're going to go into them in detail in just a minute. Um, but just wanted to mention that intersex gender is um, when people are born with uh, ambiguous genitalia or genitalia that does not conform to society's standard definition of male or female sex. So when we say transgender, and uh, looking at transgender women on the left, this is someone who has changed their body or thinking about changing their body or not even their body, but thinking about changing their gender identity to be a lived gender role um, that is female, um, different from the birth assigned sex, which was male. For transgender men, it's someone who is changing or has changed their body and living in a gender role uh, that is male, uh, which is different from their birth assigned sex of female. For someone who is considered cisgender woman, which we will use throughout the presentation, this is someone whose gender identity aligns with the sex assigned at birth. So they were assigned sex female at birth and currently identify as a female. We want to acknowledge that um, according to the UCSF Transgender Primary Care Guidelines, which were updated last year, um, the definitions on this slide are coming from their earlier version, but they talk about sort of a progression or trajectory of acknowledging someone's gender and that it may be a process that is different for every person. And we also want to say that um, uh, when we refer to, uh, so that we're focusing on transgender women, excuse me, as opposed to transgender men or non-binary people. So when we say trans or transgender women, we do mean someone who identifies with female gender, um, but was assigned male sex at birth. So going back to those other three terms, so gender non-conforming, um, and these terms are very new and, uh, well, not new, they're, they're very constantly changing. Um, I, I'm very, um, uh, surprised to hear from my patients uh, different terms that they use to describe themselves, and I love learning about them. So it's good to know that this language is individual, it's personal, it's unique to the culture, and, and it does change rapidly. If at any point you're not sure what a term means when someone refers to their self, it's definitely okay that you ask for clarification. So gender nonconforming is someone whose gender identity differs from that which was assigned at birth, but it's sort of more complex, fluid, and, and maybe just less clear than someone who considers themselves, for instance, a transgender woman. Someone who is gender fluid is someone who may be feeling, identifying more with a male identity on some days and other days a female identity. Non-binary is transgender or gender non-conforming persons who identify as neither male nor female. They just do not put themselves in one of those two boxes. And gender queer is someone whose gender identity is neither male or female, but it could be between or beyond genders or it's some combination. And um, this can be you know, political, political. Uh, it can be used to challenge gender stereotypes. Um, and some people who are genderqueer may not pursue any changes to physically change their body, and they also may not identify as trans. So it could as, you know, exist on its own. Um, we want to acknowledge that the importance of recognizing cis and transgender individuals as deserving of holistic, comprehensive care that addresses sexual health and HIV prevention. We want to also state that there are differences between cis women and trans women, and that those uh, differences in how they live their lives um, definitely impact how HIV prevention should be tailored to them. So this question is something we don't have a formal response for, but we'd like for you to think to yourself, does offering healthcare services for transgender women around both HIV prevention, which includes PrEP and gender affirmation services, does that improve uptake of PrEP among transgender women? So the answer is yes. 
um, that consolidating those services and affirming someone's gender is very important for the act of HIV prevention. So gender affirmation, um, this is basically the social process of being recognized or affirmed in one's gender identity, expression, or role. And Sari Reisner, who's a prominent uh, researcher in transgender health, and um, their colleagues identified four constructs which, um, where gender affirmation needs to occur as a social process. So you have social gender affirmation, which is someone being referred to by their preferred name or pronoun. You have psychological gender affirmation, where that person feels that, you know, the people are respecting their gender and validating it and resisting their internalized stigma or other people's transphobia. There's medical gender affirmation, which is where someone may, um, as an adolescent, take pubertal blockers um, or later on take hormone therapy and maybe, maybe not um, go through gender confirmation surgery. Legal gender affirmation is the process of changing your name or your gender marker on your ID document. We want to make clear that someone does not have to go through these steps in this order, nor do they have to go through all of them or, or none of them. Um, someone's process and identity of, of, of gender is really individual and, and up to that person. So, we're going to talk briefly about the current epidemiology of HIV infection in both cis and trans women with the goal of highlighting the specific risk for HIV infection for all women. So about examining the epidemiology related to HIV infection and risks for women highlights the need to screen for potential indication of HIV in people regardless of their sexual or gender identity. And also talks about, we want to talk about how we want to increase our efforts to utilize all of the recommended methods to decrease HIV transmission, which includes PrEP. So, another question. Which of the following populations is impacted by the highest prevalence of HIV infection? Transgender women, excuse me, transgender men, cisgender men, African-American transgender women, African-American cisgender women. So the answer is African-American transgender women. And we're gonna show you that right here. So the total number of women across races living with HIV in the United States at the end of 2014 was estimated to be 218,653. Across all diagnoses in 2015, HIV diagnosis has declined um, compared to the previous four years but cisgender women continue to be at risk for HIV infection. In 2015, they comprised 19% of the 39,500 new infections in the US. And of these, 86% was attributable to heterosexual sex, while 13% was from injection drug use. We also know that African-American women continue to suffer a disproportionate impact related to HIV. And so you can see here that a little over 58% of cis women identified as Black or African American, and on the right side, 51% of trans women living with HIV identify as African American. Moving on to the transgender health or women data, we want to say that it's very well established that gathering data to describe these patients is very challenging and remains elusive. Um, there are sampling challenges, um, lack of population size estimates that are adequate, um, stigma and discrimination in terms of recruiting. And the small samples that make it difficult to um, come up with reasonable inferences. However, recently, uh, the Williams uh, Institute in California did estimate that there are approximately 1.4 million adults in the U.S. who identify as transgender. And this chart here shows that between 2009 and 2014, um, about 1,974 trans women were diagnosed with HIV. And the important part is that this is a staggering 22% prevalence rate for trans women in the U.S. And this rate is 49 times greater than the risk for reproductive age population at the international level and within the U.S. It's a 34-fold higher increase. For transgender men, we don't have as much data, um, but we can say that the rates are much smaller, uh, less than a fifth of the number of trans women infected with HIV. So this these data show that you know, we have a concentrated epidemic uh, in trans women, and they really are a key population that we should focus HIV prevention on. 
So the question is, why are trans women living, so many living with HIV? Well, there's many, many layers of stigma and discrimination that disproportionately impact them. And a lot of these discriminatory practices are not the direct cause for HIV transmission, but they're a result of significant increased vulnerability to HIV. So that is, you know, such as institutional. So this is reflected in policies or laws that discriminate against trans people, such as behaviors related to bathroom laws. Um, there's structural discrimination, which is, uh, you know, the socioeconomic uh, injustice, um, high rates of crimes against trans individuals, high rates of employment discrimination, um, so just general lack of adequate income opportunities. And in society, uh, we know that they are um, experiencing more rejection and mistreatment, um, which can uh, result in sexual abuse or assault. And then there's the internalized sort of stigma, which is, you know, those negative feelings that trans people have for themselves or even other trans people. So we also know that within the transgender female population, those who have sex with cisgender males, uh, especially cisgender men who have sex with other men or bisexual males, they are also at higher risk for HIV. So what we need to do is take a detailed sexual health history and social history to find out you know, what the specific risk is for that person and then offer screening and prevention as necessary. So, you know, again, as mentioned before, we respect that there are unique differences between cis and trans women in terms of their risk, but there's also a lot of shared risks that are listed here. So women most at risk for HIV have histories of trauma and abuse, uh, including sexual assault, physical abuse, um, domestic violence. Um, consistent with those high rates of trauma, there's higher rates of mental health concerns, um, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, in people, women who have been diagnosed with HIV, and higher rates of mood and substance use disorders. And these have all been linked with an increased risk for engaging in riskier sex behaviors, such as condomless sex, as well as the decreased ability for a woman to negotiate for safer practices, such as having their partner use a condom. And the also higher rates of economic insecurity for both trans and cisgender women has been linked to uh, exchanging sex for food or just basic necessities. Um, so, you know, we, we, again, respect the differences, but we also want to acknowledge that there are things that do tie both cis and transgender women together in terms of HIV risk. So, given the prevalence and the risk factors for HIV uh, within cis and transgender women, we're gonna look at the different guidelines as to how we should be screening women for HIV. We just passed our National HIV Testing Day on June 27th. Okay, so another question. Um, who should be screened for HIV according to the CDC guidelines and the United States Preventive Task Force recommendations? Uh, transgender women, uh, cisgender woman who's heterosexual, monogamous with a male partner for five years, a cisgender woman, heterosexual, non-monogamous partner for six months, a trans woman seeking sexually transmitted infection services, or all people ages 13 to 64? Think about your answer. So the answer is all people ages 13 to 64. And here we go. So according to the CDC guidelines, which were released in 2006, we really should be screening all people in that age group. And then we can screen further based on risk or rescreen. So these recommendations do not differ based on gender or sexual identity. So in all healthcare settings, you have that age range. If someone is initiating tuberculosis treatment, they should be tested for HIV. And at every time that someone comes in for an STI evaluation, HIV should be included. Then you can repeat it based on the risk in terms of new partners or if there's an occupational exposure. And in terms of placing someone in a high-risk category, which may help you determine a more frequent screening schedule, that may be someone who has an HIV-positive partner, um, they're engaging in injection drug use, or their partner is, or they're exchanging sex for money. And again, we want to you know, say that this has no difference based on sex or gender identity and that the guidelines don't actually um, use the word transgender anywhere in there. So 
Um, and the US uh, PSTF, they, their recommendations just expen extend the age range to 15 to 65. So HIV screening is voluntary. Uh, it's only with the um, patient's knowledge and understanding that the testing is planned. So they have the ability to opt out, which you know they can decline. Um, no coercion and no testing without knowledge. And we should document declines in the charts. Uh, I will say only Nebraska and New York do not have opt-out testing. New York, which is quite progressive, is uh, foregoing uh, the informed consent for rapid testing in healthcare settings, which of course can lower barriers. And so the UCSF transgender um, guidelines, they again don't uh, make a difference between trans or cisgender screening recommendations. Uh, really, you should focus your screening and services on the biological, psychological, and social needs of the population. And the risk assessment requires the ability for you to obtain that sexual history that is accurate and also involves the specific anatomy and sexual behavior uh, that trans people are engaging in. For the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, they follow CDC guidelines. Uh, routine testing for all females, age 13 to 64. Um, and they talk about, and especially pregnant women, um, and repeat testing, even in the absence of identified risk factors, was actually um, emphasized. Okay, and then this is sort of just a slide to give us some talking points for how we can engage in that comprehensive sexual uh, history taking um, task of our visit. So we definitely need to ask the type of sexual activity, you know, what body parts are going where, who's doing what to whom. Um, are you planning on having children, preventing having children, and how does that sort of tie into sexual health? Um, talking about the partners, um, tell me more about your partners, you know, do you have more than one partner? Do you know their HIV status? Um, protection from STIs, just kind of figuring out, is there, is there, is there any barrier protection being used? for oral, anal, or vaginal sex, and kind of exploring why or why not that those barrier protections were used. And exploring past STI history, especially HIV testing, uh, whether drug or alcohol use has any impact on decisions made within sexual activity. And then the last question was recommended um, off of a 2014 provision for quality family planning guidelines. Um, just to really, um, you know, holistically be an open-ended question. Do you have any reproductive or sexual health needs today? All right. We're going to move on to protocols, and I will hand it over to Kathleen. Thank you, Jill. Um, in 2014, guidelines were released by the Centers for Disease Control promoting the utilization of PrEP for individuals at risk for HIV acquisition, including heterosexually active men and women. These are detailed guidelines, and I would encourage you to review them if you haven't already. The link to these guidelines is on your screen. The 2014 guidelines leave some significant questions particularly for transgender clients. In the upcoming slides, we will explore the implications of these guidelines for both cis and transgender women. Take a minute and look at the regimens on the screen and answer the following question if you can. The only FDA approved regimen for PrEP in the United States for all populations is 300 milligrams of TDF, co-formulated with FTC, sold as Trivada, Mtriva, by Reed, a generic version of 300 milligrams of TDF co-formulated with FTC, or both A and D? The correct answer is E, both A and D. PrEP indica the indication for PrEP is in healthy adults with a risk or at risk of acquiring HIV infection. This includes MSM, sexually active men and women, injection drug users, but noticeably absent in the CDC recommendations, transgender people. The regimen for all populations is 300 milligrams of TDF co-formulated with 200 milligrams of FTC sold under the trade name of Truvada, 
And this is based on a grade 1A recommendation as far as strength of evidence. The use of additional or other antiretroviral therapies for PrEP has not, is not recommended with the strength recommendation grade of 3A. As of 2014 guidelines, coitally timed or other non-continuous daily use is not recommended, and this is a grade 3A recommendation. We will look closer at some of the evidence behind these guidelines and why daily adherence seems to be especially important for women. TDF alone can be considered alternate, an alternative regimen for heterosexually active men and women and injection drug users based on efficacy trials. No trials on the efficacy of TDF alone for MSM or presumably transgender, although not mentioned in the guidelines, have been completed by, had been completed by the publication of the 2014 guidelines. As you can see, there is a generic formulation of Truvada that was approved by the FDA on June 8, 2017. Although it's approved, it is not currently available on the U.S. market, and some sources predict that it will be some time before it's available. Availability of this generic option could have important cost and access implications, but it's simply too soon to predict how that will be realized in the marketplace. Let's now look at cisgender women and the PrEP studies that were done before 2014. The study data specific to women prompting the 2014 CDC PrEP guideline update were based on three key studies demonstrating the efficacy of PrEP in women. One of the concerns raised early on and one continuing to impact PrEP prescribing habits of providers nearly five years after the approval of the PrEP guidelines for all populations, including women, are concerns related to the efficacy among women as compared to men. All of the studies, including women, for oral efficacy of TDF-FTC emphasized that adherence was absolutely critical. Two early trials of PrEP in women were the FEMPREP and the TDF2 trials. You can see that both of these trials had low efficacy rates for HIV prevention in the active arm versus the placebo arm. In fact, the FEMPREP trial was stopped at interim analysis. Follow-up analysis of the active participants showed that there were detectable blood levels in less than 40% of the active arm participants. The PARTNERS PREP study was a phase three multi-center randomized controlled double-blind three-arm placebo controlled trial enrolling heterosexual IV10 discordant couples in Kenya and Uganda between 2008 and 2010. The active arm included TDF alone and TDF-FTC co-formulated. Among the female participants, efficacy was on average 71% in the TDF alone arm and 66% in the TDF-FTC co-formulated arm. Among all participants, both men and women, in either of the active arms, there were 29 seroconversions compared to 52 in the placebo arms. However, when evidence was evaluated, evidence of adherence was evaluated by considering plasma levels among all the active arm participants who seroconverted, only 31% had detectable levels of medication in plasma samples. One theory regarding the significant difference in adherences between the partners PrEP study versus the TDF2 or the FEMPREP relates to the fact that participants in the partners PrEP study knew they were at risk for HIV acquisition from their known HIV-1 infected partner, whereas participants in the TDF and the FEMPREP studies did not have known HIV-1 infected partners. Studies in cisgender women post-2014 
have continued to examine critical issues of efficacy in women. The VOICE project had data, data was collected between 2009 and 2011 and published in 2015. This study, which included oral TDF, oral TDF with FTC, and daily intravaginal TDF gel experienced very poor adherence, which impacted efficacy. The TDF alone arm was stopped at interim analysis due to futility. Alternatively, the Partners Demonstration Project, published by the same lead author of the Partners Prep Study we just discussed, was an open label implementation project to evaluate delivery feasibility uptake and adherence among zero discordant couples in Kenya. This study provided antiretroviral therapy to the HIV positive individual within the zero discordant couple and PrEP to the uninfected individual. There were a total of 1,013 couples initially enrolled. However, follow-up analysis demonstrated 12 of these, in 12 of these couples, the HIV-1 uninfected partner at was actually infected at the time of the enrollment, leaving only 1,001 couples in the analysis. There were ultimately only two HIV-1-0 conversions, both in the initially uninfected female partner and both zero conversions were again due to adherence. No active TDF was detectable in the plasma of either female at the time of conversion. A meta-analysis of oral TDF-based PrEP studies through 2014 by Fauner and colleagues demonstrated that when PrEP is utilized more, greater than 70% of the time, it demonstrates significant efficacy in preventing HIV in all populations. Initial ana additional analyses of these studies we've discussed in the last two slides and some others have continued to provide data to address drug-drug interactions, side effects, effects on bone health, and creatinine of PrEP in women. So another self-assessment question. Current CDC guidelines for PrEP include recommendations for transgender women, true or false? And the answer is false. Unfortunately, prior to the 2014 PrEP guidelines, there simply wasn't enough data to demonstrate efficacy of PrEP in transgender women. Since those 2014 guidelines, further studies have been initiated and additional analyses of earlier studies, which included transgender individuals, such as the IPREC study, have been conducted. The meta-analysis published by Fauner and colleagues in 2016, we mentioned and a few minutes ago demonstrated that when clients are adherent, PrEP has demonstrated high efficacy across all populations, but that some populations, including transgender, transgender individuals, warrant continued surveillance regarding safety due to their underrepresentation in the studies done through 2015. The best evidence regarding efficacy in transgender women currently available comes from the IPREX phase three randomized placebo control trial and the follow-up IPREX open label extension. Similar to the studies we have just discussed in cisgender women, efficacy is shown to be linked to adherence. In the 11 zero conversions of the IPREX RTC None of the 11 had detectable medication in their blood plasma at the time of zero conversion. In the open label extension, there were two zero conversions in the transgender group. Of the two, one was in a participant who elected not to continue the PrEP, and one had plasma levels that detectable that demonstrated that they had been using less than two tablets per week at the time of zero conversion. Unfortunately, although the ADAPT trial and the demo project both attempted to enroll transgender participants, enrollment was very low and no separate analyses of these participants has been conducted. Now we'll examine efficacy in women of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. 
One of the key points from these studies that we've just talked about, and one of the persistent questions is why the efficacy of tenofovir-based PrEP may be different in men versus women. Part of the answer appears to be in these pharmacokinetic prof properties of tenofovir, or TDF-based PrEP. The efficacy of TDF depends on multiple factors impacting direct cellular uptake at the site where HIV virus will come in contact and the phosphorylation of both TDF and FTC in their active forms. You can see demonstrated in the box under the intracellular step, TDF must be converted to tenofovir diphosphate and FTC must be converted to emcitrabine 5-triphosphate or lamivudine in triphosphate. Sorry about that. In each step between taking PrEP and achieving antiviral effect is impacted by a variety of other factors that you can see detailed between the boxes. Adherence, absorption, clearance, distribution, and transporters also impact plasma concentrations. Plasma concentrations then have to convert to cellular uptake within the various types of tissues. Cellular uptake depends on blood flow, tissue mass transporters, and kinases, phosphatases, transporters, and again, specific cell types also impact these factors. Within the cells, intracellular activities must result in successful competition against endogenous deoxynucleoside triphosphates for reverse transcriptase which can be modulated by immunity. Each of these steps may also be influenced by hormones. In vitro studies demonstrate that both estrogens and progestins can increase or decrease the active metabolites of both tenofovir and FTC. A depiction of one of those routes is, that has been studied for TDF is demonstrated on this slide. In colon cells, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and vaginal cells, adenyl kinase 2 is needed to convert tenofovir to tenofovir monophosphate. The next step is for phosphorylation, to, and this phosphorylation is different between colon cells and vaginal cells. In both vaginal cells and the peripheral blood cells, estrogen regulates creatinine kinase whereas in colon cells, creatinine kinase directly phosphorylates TDF. Two critical questions for women remain. For cisgender women, does this explain differences in efficacy, and does it mean that alternate regimens, such as event-based regimens, are not an option? And for transgender women, should dosages be adjusted if they are on active estrogen therapy? Another question or concern is about time to achieving protection and the impact of pharmacokinetics of the combination of drugs to affect the time needed to achieve protection. Officially, CDC guidelines state that the time is simply not known. Part of this is because the pharmacokinetics of TDF and FTC rely on uptake in tissue at the potential site of exposure. This varies from seven days in rectal tissue to up to 20 days in vaginal tissue and blood serum. For transgender clients, there are additional questions for the small population of individuals studied who have penile inversion procedure for vaginoplasty. This is only about 10% of transgender women, according to the USTS 2015, a national survey. All of this highlights the need for discussion with your clients of a competent of their comprehensive sexual health history, including the practices they engage in. Despite the need to continue to study many aspects of PrEP utilization for both cis and transgender women, CDC did recommend that PrEP be offered to healthy adult women who have sex with men and meet the following criteria. More than one partner in a lifetime, and at least one of the following, sex with a known HIV infected partner or any condomless sex within the last four weeks or sex regardless of condom use with a high risk partner within the last 12 months. Estimates from 2015 predict that approximately 468,000 women in the US would meet these eligibility criteria. These estimates are based on the NHANES studies and the survey of family growth. 
transgender people were not mentioned expressly in the CDC PrEP guidelines, nor in the accompanying provider supplement, except very briefly when acknowledging that transgender women were included in the study population for the IPREC study. This has caused some quandaries assessing their needs because based on the published CDC guidelines, as well as some challenges in the language for understanding who meets PrEP screening guidelines or needs a prescription for PrEP. PrEP initiation for women at risk of acquiring HIV follows the same guidelines as for other populations meeting eligibility for PrEP. HIV status, pregnancy test, Hep B and C testing um, are all part of the routine screening process. Let's take a look at a few of the points which impact women. Renal function. The use of TDF in treatment of HIV patients has demonstrated adverse effects on renal function. Studies of utilization of TDF in uninfected women have shown variable data regarding impact on kidney function. Hepatitis B lab interpretation. Hepatitis B status is critical to evaluate, document, and provide care prior to the initiation of TDF FTC for PrEP. Based on their HIV, H hepatitis status, recommended actions are included on this slide. In addition to initiation protocol, some of the routine follow-up protocols for PrEP have additional implications for women. For cisgender women, Recommendations are to provide pregnancy testing every three months. If a woman does become pregnant, FTC guidelines recommend discussing the possible risks and benefits of continuation of PrEP as the effects of the fetus are largely unknown. Side effect PrEPs, there are no gender differences known up to this point. Counseling PrEP patients regarding the startup syndrome, the mild headache, nausea, flatulence, and dizziness is important. Most persons who initiate PrEP do not experience this side effects initially or at any point in the treatment. However, it's important for adherence purposes to provide the counseling. One should also monitor for the signs and symptoms of acute renal injury or for acute HIV infection. Bone health is an important consideration in all patients, and especially so in women. The CDC guidelines reference only the data related to MSM in regards to changes in bone mineral density. More recently, analysis of African women who participated in the VOICE trial has provided additional information on bone mineral density in women. However, if you recall, that study had significant problems with adherence. Therefore, the clinical data and its significance is unclear. The EPREC study of transgender women also showed slight decreases in bone mineral density as in, in the transgender women cohort. In June, new guidance was released by the Centers for Disease Control regarding benefits of utilizing PrEP as an adjunctive method of HIV prevention during attempted conception. In addition to the previous guidelines regarding advising serodiscordant couples of the available options for safer conception, these new guidelines acknowledge the costs and potential lack of access most couples will face in accessing sperm washing and assisted reproductive technologies. If a couple is pursuing pregnancy or has pregnancy occur while the female is on either PrEP or in the case that she's the HIV positive partner on antiretroviral therapy, it is encouraged to register her in the antiretroviral pregnancy registry. This registry allows continued accrual of safety data used to treat HIV infection. With all these advances in understanding and the utilization of PrEP in trans and cisgender women, where do we still face questions and where are the gaps awaiting future advances? The state of the science 
regarding PrEP for transgender women is still quite limited. There continue to be multiple questions in addressing feasibility, acceptability, and effectiveness, as well as patterns for medication use in transgender women. Concerns regarding underrepresentation of transgender women in current and previous studies require innovative methods to improve retention. Some recommendations include establishing representation at all levels of the st study project, including the members of the study staff with influence on project design and implementation. Drug interactions with PrEP and what we know about them so far is that there are relatively few drug interactions and for many of the drugs that are commonly used in transgender women for medical treatments, there is no data. At the current time, the data that we do have, however, supports a low potential for interactions between estradiol and norgestimate, which are commonly used in women. I don't know how to back up the slide, but there are currently several clinical trials underway. They were listed on the previous slide, and we're anxiously awaiting the results of those trials. An alternative PrEP regimen using an intravaginal ring with dipivirine has also been studied. There have been two phase three studies published. Similar to studies in other women, both of these studies faced adherence as a critical issue in risk reduction and adherence was directly tied to the results. PrEP provider knowledge is extremely important in the utilization and accessibility of this type of drug therapy to our populations of both cis and transgender women. A key factor in improving clinical care for cis and transgender women is provider knowledge and clinical care improvements. Suggestions from leaders in the field include avoiding segmentation of sexual and reproductive health services along gender binary lines and bundling gender affirming care services and HIV prevention and or HIV services has been shown to increase synergistic value. Respecting diversity in patients' gender identity and expression is key to establishing and maintaining relationships with clients that will lead to health promotion and engagement. The brief sexuality-related communication recommendations released by the WHO in 2015 provide an excellent tool for training all levels of staff and providers on rights-based and sex-positive approaches. I'm going to now turn it over to Jill for the case study. All right. So we're going to breeze through this case study. Um, but so basically, we have a 25-year-old Hispanic transgender female named Alexa who presents for transfer of care. Um, she's been taking estrogen for her transition for about um, over six years just relocated to the area looking for a provider. Um, her sexual health history um, includes being sexually active with male partners. She's had more than five in her lifetime, uses condoms sometimes, and her last unprotected intercourse was about two weeks ago. She's on some feminizing hormones. She's on estradiol one milligram uh, three times a day, which is um, not a typical regimen. Typically, it's uh, once a day or twice a day. Um, or plus finasteride, which is her androgen blocker. And she's taking that um, half a five milligram pill, I presume, once a day. Um, her last STI testing, she's not sure. Um, she works part-time, doesn't smoke, no drugs, um, no history of violence or abuse, and has about three to five alcohol drinks per day. So the uh, questions are, what options for HIV prevention could you discuss with Alexa today? Uh, you know, we could talk about uh, condoms, barrier protection, um, reducing partners, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, and also pre-exposure prophylaxis. So let's say we were proceeding with PrEP, what screenings would you want to order? 
Uh, we would want to do, obviously, HIV. We would do gonorrhea chlamydia after asking her uh, which um, types of sex she engages in, uh, insertive or receptive oral, anal, um, kind of figuring out where to do all of our swabs, uh, checking for syphilis, hepatitis B, um, hepatitis C, uh, and then hepatitis A, probably just uh, in case we wanted to vaccinate her if she's not immune already. And if we were going to go further and take care of her uh, feminizing uh, hormone uh, medication follow-up, we might do a metabolic panel, cholesterol, testosterone, or estrogen. And the follow-up plan that would be appropriate would be to hand her a pamphlet on PrEP, maybe connect her to a counselor if they're available, a social worker who's knowledgeable about PrEP, um, and schedule a follow-up visit in about one to two weeks to discuss. So we're going to go ahead and move on to questions, actually. Um, and I think that we don't have a, or here we go. Here we go. Okay. So you guys can type in your questions in the lower right-hand box um, for Kathleen and I. And I think one question I know, oh, yeah. Oh, hi, Jessica. <laughs> hi. Um, um, this is just me typing in again to say uh, thank you both for that excellent presentation. And let's get to the questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, so our first question comes from David, who asks, what is PEP and who are good candidates? So PEP, as I mentioned previously, is post-exposure prophylaxis. So that is um, a, uh, typically a, it's a three-drug three regimen that is given to people who have had a, a sexual or injection uh, uh, needle exposure to a high-risk uh, person living with HIV or unknown HIV infection status. Um, so the CDC just released updated guidelines last year for what we call NPEP, which is non-occupational PEP. Uh, the medications used are Truvada plus either an integrase inhibitor, uh, Tivike or Isentris, or that is Dolutegravir or Raltegravir. Um, and again, within 72 hours, it should be started. Um, so the people who are candidates are um, those who have, um, you know, had a high-risk exposure that's considered high risk enough in the sense that there's been blood or vaginal discharge or semen or breast milk exposure. And remembering that receptive anal sex carries the highest risk of HIV transmission and oral sex the least. Um, in my experience, typically, I don't follow the algorithms too closely. Uh, I just have a discussion with the patient, and we, I rarely turn down PEP if it's asked for. And if it's asked for too much, we talk about PrEP. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stacy, who asks, could you please restate the estrogen impact in people using PrEP? Um, the estrogen, okay, so uh, for people, for trans, well, for, for cis women on PrEP, there's no significant interactions with uh, oral contraceptives per se, uh, or contraceptives, period. Um, for trans women, there is no known significant interactions where the estrogen will be reduced because of taking Truvada, so we can reassure our trans women that their hormone regimen will not be affected by Truvada. In terms of the other way around, that was that sort of complicated slide of trying to figure out if there's any estrogen modulation in the rectal tissue that changes the uh, level of tenofovir in the rectal tissue, which then can correspond to maybe a variable level of protection. So that's what we don't know. Um, we do know that for vaginal tissue, you need uh, to have longer time to get to the adequate levels of the drug in the vaginal tissue. Um, so, and we know that even though there is some data supporting event-based PrEP, which is where you can take PrEP uh, planned ahead, you know, around a planned sexual exposure, we really cannot do that at all for, um, for vaginal intercourse. There's not enough data based on those tissue levels. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Michelle who asks, is there anything that you do differently when discussing PrEP for cis and transgender women compared to men who have sex with men? And is it harder to achieve buy-in from cis and trans women compared to men who have sex with men? So I do think it's a little harder to uh, achieve buy-in with cis women, and this is simply because they're just not as familiar with HIV prevention as men who have sex with men because of the prevalence of being much higher in um, MSM. 
but I don't think that should preclude us from bringing it up with them. Um, for trans women, I think the barrier, like I just said, is sort of convincing them that there's, their hormones will be okay and that that shouldn't have an effect on their transition. Um, in terms of approach, the one thing I do a little bit differently is I do screen more closely about intimate partner violence. Um, that can have implications for whether they choose to take PrEP in terms of not wanting that partner to, to know they're on it. So, you know, in terms of where the pill actually physically uh, is stored, knowledge of going to medical appointments or using their insurance, et cetera. Um, it also comes up pretty seamlessly for uh, cis women when we're talking about family planning. So I'm, you know, pretty sure to, to fold it in there um, when that conversation comes up. Uh, for women. So there's typically, you know, those predetermined times if they come for their annual visit. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Lori, who requested that we show the objectives again, which we will do by summarizing the key points after we finish the Q&A, Lori. So great question. Um, our next question comes from Kevin, who asks, what are some ways, uh, just to reiterate and summarize, that clinicians can start incorporating PrEP into their care of cis mm -hmm. trans women? Okay. Um, well, so concrete ways, I think, uh, so going back to also part of our objectives is for first step is really making HIV testing a universal action for all of your patients. So following those CDC guidelines, um, if you can get rapid tests through partnerships with health departments, that makes things pretty easy. Um, if you have an uh, internal EMR decision-making tool that reminds you of, you know, the, an annual or once, you know, once uh, in lifetime HIV test, that can be that automatic reminder. Um, I think that uh, advertising it, putting it on the wall, having brochures around, holding info sessions, partnering with a local health department to come in and do education sessions. Um, there was a slide in there that sort of mentioned that, you know, providers are not actually as aware of this as we hope they would be. And so part of the challenge with PrEP from the beginning has been getting the word out to both sides, both patients and providers. So I think we can't forget about um, educating providers and really, you know, reviewing the, the data, which is so, so supportive. Um, if the patient takes the pill, very supportive that PrEP works. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. That's all the time we have for Q&A at this point, but if we didn't get to your question, we would be more than happy to answer that via email if you could just email us at education at arhp.org. Um, thank you again, Jill and Kathleen, for joining us today. Before everyone ex exits this video, I'd just like to note the following. Be sure to join us on Tuesday, August 1st and 15th for the next webinar the next webinars in this series. Registration is now available on arhp.org where you will also find a recording of today's webinar. All right, so, oh, are we, are we doing key points or? We are. Okay, so HIV screening, recommended all adolescents and adults 13 to 65 at least once. You may screen more based on um, assessment of risk. Um, and you know, just remembering that um, based on that risk assessment, um, cis and transgender women, you know, should be informed of the availability of PrEP. Don't forget to mention it. Try not to get in that, you know, pigeonhole box of only offering it to men who have sex with men. Uh, remember that it's been shown to be effective in all adult populations, um, including heterosexual men and women, MSM, people who inject drugs, and trans women. Um, and um, that adherence is number one. So we really need to work on adherence in women to get those t those drug levels um, up to, to par in the, in the tissue uh, so that it can do its job. And uh, that trans women are much higher disproportionately impacted by HIV and that there's very unique concerns about medication adherence, interactions that we really need more research on. Um, but I still feel very comfortable telling my patients that if they if they take the medication every day, that it's 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 going to be very helpful, um, and that we need to increase um, research that supports the evidence based recommendations um, for basically all women, and trying to really delve into those unique considerations for women. Perfect. Thank you. So all much. right. 
As one final reminder, you will all receive an email from ARHP's Education Department in about an hour containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME or CE certificate will be generated at the end of that survey. Be sure to print the certificate before closing the internet browser. As I mentioned before, if you have questions that we didn't get to on this webinar or any other questions, just email us at education at ARHP.org. Thank you for taking the time to view this webinar. We hope you will take part in other live and on-demand activities hosted by ARHP.